Rain. Hey kids, I know what you're asking. Whoa. Why are you looking so fly? Well, well. Tonight I'm going to an art show, okay? Sure. But art's not the thing I want to talk about today. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite YouTube channels, Smarter Every Day. Goggle up. Science is about to happen. Smarter Every Day is a YouTube channel that features videos about science taught by this guy named Dustin from Alabama. Uh, I've only started watching this channel quite recently, but I basically instantly fell in love with Dustin's passion for science and the world around him. And it's kind of convenient that I'm talking about it this week because they just celebrated their 100th episode, which is pretty big deal. If you get nothing else from this video, please go and check out at least two videos from Smarter Every Day. I recommend Cat Physics and The Prince Rupert's Drop. Those are both pretty cool. Links in the bottom bar. So I really like learning and I really like creative education. So Destin's videos are really cool for me. And just when I think it couldn't get any better, he puts these awesome Bible verses at the end of his videos. A lot of them are from the Psalms. I mean, you got Psalm 8, 3, and 4 for the space video. You have Psalm 139, 19 for the baby video. You have Psalm 111, 2 for the Prince Rupert's drop and Proverbs 4 for the ants video. All of these verses are related to creation and how awesome it is that we have an infinitely minded God who can create these things. Like Destin, I'm an engineer, though you might not know it from some of the topics of my YouTube video. And I think I know just a thing or two about science. And I have this great appreciation for how things work in the world around us. But one thing that makes this appreciation so much sweeter is the fact that we have this infinite mind that we can look up to who created all of these wonderful things. For a normal engineer or scientist, he looks at the world, observes it and its complexities, sees how cool it is, and takes joy in it, and that's cool. But for the believer, he looks around at the world, he observes it, he sees how cool and complex it is, and he gets to appreciate the infinitely minded person who created it all, the person whom he has a personal relationship with. Lots of people wanna look at faith and science as two different and opposing camps, and honestly, I just don't think that's a wise thing to do. For one thing, many of history's greatest scientists were actually believers. I mean, you got guys like, Kepler and Faraday and Newton and Pascal. All of these guys had strong beliefs in God and were committed to living their lives for him. Most of them were trained to be clergymen before they ever made their major discoveries in science. I posted a few links in the bottom bar about some of the faiths of these scientists and how it led their lives and, and shaped their philosophical thinking. My favorite is Pascal's wager. I think this is a really cool argument philosophically. It's actually one that I've kind of reinvented in my head. And I think it's great if you're an agnostic person to actually look into Pascal's wager. Um, yeah, just look into it. For another thing, the nature of the world around us probably points more to the evidence of a divine creator rather than the absence of one. So don't know where that came from. Not only does the Bible indicate this in Romans 1.20, but check this out. So quite a few years back, there was a science fiction movie starring Jodie Foster. You may have seen it. It's called Contact. Actually, I think my mom really likes this movie. In the movie, Jodie Foster played this SETI researcher. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, AKA Life in Outer Space. Link also in the bottom bar. And this really isn't some obscure and secluded lab group. Millions upon millions of dollars are being poured into this program to set up laboratories and scanners all across the world, all searching the universe for evidences of intelligent life in outer space. SETI has three classifications for the types of signals that it receives from outer space. Randomness, order, and information. Randomness is pretty straightforward, basically any static or noise that hits a scanner. When the scanner picks up randomness, researchers can't conclude that intelligent life actually sent this noise. The majority of signals that we receive from outer space are probably random. You can think of it as alphabet soup all jumbled up. Order represents signals that come in some sort of regular and organized form, like a wave or a pulse. Think of it as the alphabet soup going Z, X, Z, X, Z, X, Z, X, or like, moving a sine wave through space. SETI researchers can't conclude that ordered signals actually represent evidence of intelligent life in outer space because they can occur naturally. Examples of this might include some sort of signal that comes in representing a sound made by an oscillating pulsar. There's actually a really cool video about that also in the bottom bar, you should check it out. The last category for signals is that of information. This category is probably a little trickier to find because it's not random and it doesn't have to be orderly. Most of us have a sense of what it is though. I mean, information, you think of it, it can be anything from a message, to instructions, to a factual statement, to a complex pattern. It's also worth noting that SETI scanners have not picked up anything in this category to date. But in the movie, Jodie Foster plays a researcher that actually receives a signal containing information from outer space. In the movie, she picks up 
first 20 prime numbers of our number system. And in the movie, she rightly concludes that because this is information, there must be some intelligent mind that's able to send that information to us. Okay, so knowing all of this, let's switch gears from super massive scales to really tiny ones. One of the most important discoveries of 20th century biology was that of good old deoxyribonucleic acid. You probably know it as DNA. Your DNA is basically the micro scale handbook on how to put you together. Everything from your hair color to your fingerprint to your entire immune system, every single attribute of your body from the cell makeup to how all of the organ systems work together, all of it is encoded in your DNA and it's translatable. What does this mean? It means that all living things are filled with libraries of information. In fact, one milligram of your DNA contains so much more information in it than every text in the entire Library of Congress. That's kind of an outdated analogy. Let me go ahead and put it this way. One gram of your DNA contains billions of gigabytes of data encoded in it. Found an article in the bottom bar. Got so many articles today, huh? So here's my question. If, in the search for intelligent life in outer space, the assumption is that information could only come from an intelligent being, why can't we use that same assumption for information that's already been ingrained into our own existence. And given the vast amount of data, I mean much more data than you can imagine, incredibly crammed into the smallest of spaces, much smaller than you can see with your naked eye, could this not have come from the wonderfully complex mind of a creator? I guess my point is that everybody's gotta start somewhere. Everyone has a set of assumptions that we start with, and those assumptions most certainly affect your perception of reality. I mean, two plus two only equals four if you assume that addition is actually a real thing and it actually works. How did you get to those assumptions? They were revealed to you by your parents or your kindergarten teacher. Then as you went along, you did some math and you applied it to science and you found out, hey, my assumptions actually were correct. Christianity in principle isn't really all that different in the sense that we all have assumptions that we start with revealed to us by God himself. And those assumptions shape our worldview. And when we operate by those first, trusting by faith that they're true, and put aside for a sec worrying about whether or not they were good assumptions, we find that they do in fact actually work and are accurate and life-giving. Look, I know that these things don't answer every question and I could go on to talk about the tough things like creationism versus theistic evolution and probably decrease the productiveness of this video and increase the length of it. But I just want you to know that resources for things like those exist and personally I find them to be open-handed issues in which the truth is much more complex than we make it out to be. Ultimately, however, what the Bible does come down to is whether or not the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually happened not whether the world was created in seven days. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the surefire way to gauge whether or not this guy is actually who he said he was. And if he actually is who he says he is, well, then regardless of how we feel about the scientific accuracy of the Bible or even its moral teachings, we have to respond to this historic event in some way. Lord of empty space, you breathe and then create before the earth was made, you are